Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Ray, and welcome to the RayWendelik.com podcast. In this podcast, we'll keep you up to date with the latest app development tech talk. Now, here are your hosts, Drew Freeman and Jen Bailey. Thanks, Ray. This is the Ray Winderlick podcast. Welcome to episode one for season nine. This episode was recorded on Thursday, the 11th of April, 2019. This episode is sponsored by Triple Byte. I am Jen here with my WWDC bound season host, Drew Freeman. Thanks, Jen. On this episode, we have James Dempsey. James is a 15 year Apple veteran gone indie. At Apple, he was an evangelist, technical trainer, curriculum manager, software engineer, working on Aperture, iOS, macOS releases, Leopard through Lion. James recently set back out on his own after working uh, to build a cloud computer for humankind's information at UpThere. He's also the frontman of James Dempsey and the Breakpoints, a band that performs humorous original songs about technical topics. Their debut album, Backtrace, topped the iTunes comedy chart in the US, UK, Canada, and reach number five on the Billboard Comedy Album Chart. You can always check him out at jamesdempsey.net. Hi. <laughs> hey, James. Uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about when things go wrong, exceptions, errors, and other mishaps. And Jen, you want to tell them what I do after that? Then later, Drew talks about nesting turtles all the way down to hell. James, I'm really thrilled that you could join us today. It's... It's it's an honor to have you join us because I as I, I talked to you before the show I've I've known you on some level for close to fifteen years and you were doing the music back then too. Yeah, I've, uh, the first WWDC I did a song at was two thousand and one, and then from that point on, pretty much every year I did a session at WWDC while I was at Apple and also an original song. And then after leaving Apple, I thought since those were always one song a year. That was my gig. Um, maybe people would like to hear two or three songs in a row. Um, so we started doing live near WWDC, uh, which is a full concert of all of the songs that I've written. And uh, we're in our eighth year coming up uh, in June. And for the last four years, we've been doing the show as a benefit concert for App Camp for Girls. Yay. Yay! Yeah, and uh, James has also performed at the RW DevCon the past few years, and it's it's quite wonderful. If you have not listened to James's music, you're and you're a developer for for iOS and in general, it's really great because it's concept set to music. The one I was discussing earlier is the Model View Controllers song. Um, yeah, and that one. Um iOS wasn't even a thing at that point. This was 15 years ago, did I say? This uh, is Objective-C. This was uh, this when... This Objective-C. When... But the nice thing about design patterns is that they're not necessarily language-specific. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly the Cocoa frameworks and the Cocoa Touch frameworks um, are kind of based on these ideas of model view controller. Um, this was before the days of massive view controller. Um, <laughs> people complain about um however Until i get onto my section later i'll talk to about nested view controllers from gotcha. now absolutely <laughs> um and at the time uh it was there were two verses about the controller because the new feature were these cocoa bindings um which lets you to basically eliminate the glue code that we often have to write now in ios apps um, but after the fact years later it always bugged me to have a model verse, a view verse, and two controller verses. There should be one, right? <laughs> um, so that got kind of refactored um, into one <laughs> verse. It's a little more generic about controllers. Um, so it's been interesting. Like over the years, the songs kind of morph a little bit to keep up to date. So will there be a model view, view model song coming out at some point? Probably not. Because then I'd have to do a Viper song, which would take like <laughs> hours. <laughs> Of like 300 verses. Um, oh, no. 
It could be an old time. It could be an old time religion song where you just keep adding new verses to yes. it. To fit the yeah. Every single time, yes, exactly. Which leads us to to things going wrong, obviously. So you want to talk to us today about when things go wrong? Oh uh, yeah, largely I think um, when, especially when you sit down to write an app, right? You're thinking about the user experience you're trying to provide. You're thinking about you know the happy path for the user. And sometimes you maybe give short shrift or you don't maybe think as much about when things are going wrong and what are the tools available to you or the techniques available to you. Because often when things go wrong, right, that might be when the user needs your help the most um, because things are not going as expected. And I think sometimes it's important just to take a step back and, and think about how your app or how your project is handling when things aren't going right. Can you give me an example um, just to, to dive us into that? Sure. So you have an app that relies on the network and then the user gets on an airplane. And so all your networking calls come back as errors because there's no network available. Or, you know, someday the service you're using suddenly starts sending back some JSON that is incorrect. And so you're... JSON parser blows up and it's nothing that you did wrong, but your app shouldn't crash just because something went wrong on the server. You need to provide some way to gracefully degrade and give the user some sort of experience besides crashing. See, now, I don't know if it's the Eastern European in me, but I always assume the worst case when I'm writing software and depending <laughs> on somebody else. So I'm always <laughs> having, okay, so so what happens if this fails or that fails or the other thing fails? I, I, I know that I've, I've gone long on some of my estimates because I'm, I, I'm more interested in the fail cases than the succeed cases. Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, very often, like once you start thinking about it, the fail cases... Um, there's many, many more of them than the one happy path of everything going right. So it potentially takes up a fair amount of time that you might not put into your estimate or that many folks might not put into their estimates because they're thinking about everything going right and things don't always go right. So do you suggest a, a system for, for how to, to do the process of making sure you're covering bases? Well, I think... One of the nice things we get with uh, in Swift are APIs that are throwing exceptions, or excuse me, throwing errors, not exceptions in Swift. Any APIs that throw is a good hint that, yes, something could go wrong here. But then other things like you've written this photo app, for instance, that relies on the camera and on your onboarding, the user gives you permission to use the camera. But then a week later, they go into settings and turn off permission to use your camera. Well, what are you going to do? Um, again, you need to provide some kind of graceful experience. It's pretty much just trying to think of the worst case scenario of what am I doing and what could possibly go wrong here? And then what am I going to, how do I present that to the user? What do I do in the app? I don't know, but sometimes you have those cases that are like, the code with the log statement, the code should never get here. Well, what should you do if the code does get there? <laughs> like sometimes you just log, but we know that once we put something out into the world, we don't see those log statements. So if a certain number of customers are getting them, maybe you should, if you're using analytics, report it somehow, but think through those bad cases essentially. One of the things that I, I don't see a lot of in software you see it more in games than anything else, and it surprises me, is version requirements. In other words, it touches base with the server. The server says, you don't have the latest version of the software. You should update or this app won't necessarily work. And I find that it's annoying to the end user that may not necessarily want to update, but if you have a critical update, there's nothing better than saying there is an update available because a lot of people tend to forget in the world of mobile, somebody can download your game, or your app, and it's out there forever. Mm -hmm. Or it's out there until Apple says we no longer support 32-bit, and they're wondering why their app doesn't work anymore because they haven't taken the, the time to go back to the App Store and find out they've got 5,000 updates available. Yeah, there's that strategy for, especially when your back-end changes, the server-side API changes, 
you can potentially like have a version that straddles the two, um, but that's a fair amount of work. You can leave an old API around for a little while potentially, but yeah, once again, that cutoff or being able to say this is no longer valid and having your the app that you already shipped, you can't go back and stick that code in after the fact, right? It has no. to be, it sure. has to be already coded to deal with the fact that the API version may change and the user might need to go get a new version. Um, so that's uh, yet yeah, another thing that you need to kind of think about before you ship because you can't put the error handling in after you ship, especially when the error handling is telling them they need a new version because you'd have to ship it in a new version that they don't know to download because you didn't tell them. Yeah, I mean, it, the App Store has done wonders for the ability to have automatic updating turned on. Yes, absolutely. I mean, James, you and I both remember a time easily when the idea of automatic updating consisted of finding one of those third-party tools that sort of user-collected the information and said, I think your app may now have an update. But other no. than that, you were, you were on your own. How oh, yeah. inefficient. You did not know at all. Um, well, in fact, uh, I think classic Mac OS is one of the first that had software updates way, mm -hmm. way back when. And before that, you were scrounging around to find CDs, CD-ROMs, or stacks of floppies. <laughs> I, I have installed Linux on over 35, three and a quarter inch floppies. So. I oh, thought yes. 10 was bad for Windows way back when. Oh, no. I, I remember having the floppies and having 0, 01 slash 30. Oh, wow. <laughs> and you'd sit there and you'd put one disc in and it would just chew for five or six minutes and then say, now put in floppy two. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Same with System 7 way, way back. Oh, the oh. worst would be you get them and then you get to like eight or nine discs in and then you put one in and your floppy drive doesn't read it. Oh, what a nightmare. <laughs> oh, no. That, that, that's, and you've already spent, like, I don't know, 40 minutes, an hour, trying to get this oh thing installed. And this is why your software on iOS can only be so large or you can't download it over the cellular network. What is it, 500 meg now? It might even Something be bigger size. now. Might be bigger. And once 5G hits the world, then obviously they'll, they'll ratchet that up a bit. Wow. So let's see. So we've talked about networking, and uh, we've also talked about the idea of, of throwing. I, I have to say that as much as I love Swift's syntax, I'm still not sold on catch, let, error. Okay. That, that, syntax that syntax just sort of, I don't know, it gnaws at me as it just doesn't feel right. I don't know why. Well, for me, I'm, I, I'm not a big fan of the... the uh keyword do like a do mm. block it's just i don't know it just seems kind of like well for me it's a do while block not a do do catch oh, sure, block sure. um it's just i i never even like do while block like do is just such a mamby pamby kind of keyword i don't know <laughs> it reminds me when programs were pretty much written in just a do while mm -hmm. like old old style code yeah i oh, yeah, think like the event where you ran your the own event event. loop Yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's what it reminds me of. So I think the problem that I have with catch let is that most of the stuff that throws doesn't tell you what kind of an error it's throwing. And there are some things that will throw an NS error. There are some things that will throw a Swift error, but the documentation very rarely tells you what type of thing is going to be thrown. Yes. Um, and that is one of the, I don't want to say it's an oddity, but it definitely is one of the places where you don't have any hints in the language itself, where in Java, it'll tell you what kind of exception is being thrown. In this case, you kind of are on your own. And the only thing you really do know about it is that it's it conforms to the error protocol, which is there's there's not much to that protocol. Um, it's not like the protocol has a hinting place in it to say, hey, here's a name of class or something that you can pull from the error protocol. Right. So then you need to either know the API you're using 
based on the documentation, even though there's no API contract, right? Something that currently throws an NS error doesn't have to continue. There's nothing in the API that says it has to. Um, so you can't hard code your code to like as exclamation point things or you shouldn't because that's dangerous. Um, then you're just making things go wrong when things go wrong. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I, I as question mark a lot. I, I optional as my error mm -hmm. a lot just to say, okay, are you up? Let my error optional as an NS error. Does it work? Does it not work? And there is some bridging between NS error and error, which makes that even more annoying. Um, and they introduced a new, um, is it a localized error protocol that has, yeah. it, it more closely covers the NS error API. Um, and so even if somebody's not using NS errors in their own API, hopefully they're throwing something that's a localized error that conforms to that protocol so you could treat those the same as an NS error and get more information out of the error itself. Um, in the original Cocoa APIs, um, the error is specifically meant to be something that's user presentable, whereas an exception is meant to be something where the programmer has screwed up, has made an error. It's a programming mistake. And so... In Swift, they went very strongly that if the programmer makes a mistake, you just kill the kill the process. You just mm -hmm. fatal fa the the unfortunately named fatal error, which is not an error. <laughs> that name it's an is exception. Really, it's an exception that just kills the. There's no way kills to catch, yeah. catch an exception. Um, whereas back in Objective C, you could you could catch an exception. Um, I think that's a potential. A piece of confusion for new developers to Swift coming from another environment where you kind of try and catch exceptions and those can be programmer error exceptions or things like in Java they had an end of file exception which always struck me as funny as if like oh it never happens that a file ends <laughs> it's such an exceptional <laughs> situation <laughs> oh, it's a text file, and we got to the end of it. Oh my gosh, that's <laughs> such a who who knew? So I like that distinction in the the frameworks and now in the Swift language between like the programmer mistake where things just blow up, and I, the philosophy being that things blow up quickly, you die in development, and then you find your errors a lot sooner and fix them as opposed to these other, excuse me, programming mistakes. I'll use the word mistake instead of error since the terminology is confusing. You find your programmer mistakes quickly and fix them as opposed to swift errors, which are things that have gone wrong, but they're not your fault as a developer. They're just the world is an unfriendly place sometimes and the network gets turned off or what have you. So these are errors that you might want to tell the user about, hey, we can't do anything because we don't have a network connection or there seems to be some problem with the information we're receiving from the server. Maybe try again later or maybe send us an email of feedback to let us know. Um, but those are things that shouldn't kill your app. Those are things where you should take some action as a developer. Um, and I think I very much like that distinction. Um, I also think that Swift does a fairly nice job in its APIs, even though we might, uh, excuse me, in its syntax, it's not necessarily API, the do, catch, etc. cetera, um, of letting us deal with errors. What are your thoughts on try question mark? You know, I have thought of using it from time to time, but in general, I tend to believe that if I'm going to be testing something that's going to fail, I want it to fail and I want to keep it consistent throughout. I try gotcha. question mark just really makes me feel like it, ma it makes me feel like I'm doing a, an unwrap when I'm not checking. It, it just, it, it, it doesn't make me comfortable at this point. 
I gotcha. And sometimes I'll use try question mark when I'm prototyping just because yeah. I really don't care what the error was and I'm opening a file or something that I know is there. So I'm pretty sure it's not going to be an error. Um, the other time I would think about using it in production is if no matter what the error would be returned, I would be doing the same thing for the user. Right. So if like in the catch statement, there are different types of errors that I'm catching and depending on what that error is, I'm like presenting a different message to the user. Um, then the explicit catches I think are great. Um, if I'm just, no matter how this fails, I'm just going to say, uh, sorry, we wouldn't connect. We couldn't connect to the network. Um, it seems like a lot of syntactic overhead just to get to the point that, oh, we had a result or we called something, we got something back that was not, that was an error. We don't care what the error is, so I might as well just treat it like an optional. And if it's nil, I know we had an error and do the one thing that I was going to do. I think the problem when it comes to that larger case of the user has switched off the network. Mm -hmm. is that I, and I don't want to say that developers can be lazy, though developers can be lazy. I guess I did want to say it after all. Uh, <laughs> is that fact that you sometimes think of solving an error on an error by error basis and not then actually extrapolating and putting in some kind of network handling class mm -hmm. so that you've actually got a better concept of is the network up let me have a class that specifically does the network validation and let me come back. And then if I have a networking issue at that point, let me interact with my networking validation class so that I don't necessarily have to be solving the same problem every time I make a network call. Oh, absolutely. Um, but at some point, the fact that you can't reach the network is going to propagate to your UI. And it might be that the UI is always might be talking to that shared resource of the networking class. Um, but in that case, most likely you might end up doing something where the API that you create might rethrow what you got from the network, mm -hmm. or it might take what came in and um, you might not care why you're not connected to the network and you might just return an optional I once had one of these QI, QE people who they're either an absolute disaster or the most amazing thing you've ever had. And you're never quite sure which they are because these are the type of people who start a network process and then turn the network off while that network process is going on. And you're like, oh who would do that? And, and you think to yourself as a developer, who would do this? But the fact is that from a testing point of view, that's clever. Mm -hmm. Because you may you may assume I've gotten part of my networking data, so the network must be in good shape. And then, no, networks can go down for any number of reasons and at answer, any time. And the answer, who might do that, is uh, a person on a plane with a flight attendant glaring at them to go into airplane mode. And they're like, <laughs> oh, you know, you just you try to do that last thing on the plane, and then it's like, uh, and then you have to turn it off mid request. It, Never happens. <laughs> Never happens to me. I obey the. <laughs> I am totally guilty of that one. J James oh, actually earlier, reads the little card every time he gets on the plane. I do. It tells me all of the alcoholic beverages available. <laughs> oh no! I I think you meant the other card. Um, I read that one too. It's. I always check to make sure there is a flotation device. Like, how do we know those those things actually do float? I've you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna take the that. yeah. They don't demonstrate that. No, they don't. <laughs> but I'm gonna take the converse of that. That I'm happy. I don't know that. I'm happy. I've never had to learn that. <laughs> oh, me too. I really don't want to. Although I do know, you put the mask on yourself, then on others. If you have more than one child, figure out which one you love more. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Sophie's choice. I think the uh, on Southwest they usually say which one has the greater earning potential. <laughs> <laughs> she always cracks me up. And uh, oh, earlier you did mention that you don't want to say developers are lazy, but 
developers, no matter who they are, are time constrained without a doubt. Yes. Yes. Um, so sometimes we can, uh, we're time constrained, but the other developer is lazy, right? We attribute the, <laughs> <laughs> for me, it, no, the only reason I didn't do that code that, the right way was because I, we had to ship that thing. Um, but you, your code is because of a fatal flaw in yourself. <laughs> seems to be how we always play it. Now, now the, these are not coding problems. These are people problems. They are. But I think almost, uh, I think the vast majority of coding problems boil down to people problems. In and oddly end. enough, from a time travel point of view, we'll learn more about that in our next show. Oh, that sounds good. Um, <laughs> I can't wait to hear it. I think the other thing that uh, I kind of wanted to talk about in terms of when things go wrong is that uh, it's not just APIs that throw errors, right? People can have, uh, there's all of the edge cases of people having problems signing into their account if they have an account. There's a problem with their uh, their payment, their subscription. There's, there's a lot of paths that are the what happens when things don't go right for the user. Not only in the, oh, this method threw an error, but also just in the design and thinking about your app of how do I handle when things go wrong? What's that experience like? I'm reminded of the uh, comic from XKCD, which is a geek comic strip for anybody who hasn't read it. Obviously, we put links in the uh, in the show notes where a school calls up a mother asking if her child is really named something like delete semicolon table star. <laughs> uh, and it's because the by entering the child's name into their database, they had some kind of leak and the SQL code executed. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> but in, inevitably, you have to remember that a user is going to use your app in ways that you never think of, Absolutely. even the simplest apps. That's very, very true. And um, yeah, it always, uh, and again, that comes back to kind of uh, QA folks who are or testers who are testing stuff, um, who are doing trying to replicate that idea of um, of users doing anything possible. Um, I always, it always bothers me though when QA folks say that they, they break apps for a living. They don't. They, the apps were already broken. Um, they were already flawed, <laughs> right? They just, they find the broken pieces in your app. Um, it's not like they did something wrong. They did exactly what a user would do. You as the developer have already done something wrong <laughs> and they're just finding it and letting you know. Um, Somebody then, once told me that you do not write the cleverest code you can because if you were to write the cleverest code that you ever could, then you would not be qualified by definition to fix your own code if it's broken. Uh, that's true. Oh. I, I'm not a big fan of highly clever code um, in part because code unless like it's a personal project for like a something you're working on if you're working at any kind of organization somebody else will be maintaining your code and you're going to be maintaining somebody else's code over time um, so cleverness does not help at all um, sometimes it's so clever no one can read it well exactly and then there's Clever with no comments is even better because then it's the code that just sits there. Nobody touches so, it because nobody. So knows you've worked. Uh, so so you've worked on Office for my for Microsoft. <laughs> wow. I've had my hand in that in that code base uh, many well, over a decade ago, and <laughs> between it not having a lot of comments, between it being written in what's known as Microsoft Hungarian, um, <laughs> and the fact that there's a general rule there of you touch it, you own it. Yeah, you you just have to be prepared to drink from the fire hose sometimes. Oh, absolutely, and um, and that's not to say that there isn't complex code that needs to be complicated because it's doing very complicated things. Even that code 
can be difficult to read, but hopefully does it in a somewhat straightforward manner. And like anything engineering, it's a trade-off, right? A little bit of cleverness might be okay, but you know, when you're when it looks like you're the code is like an entrant in the the, the C obfuscation uh-huh. contest. Pearl, pearl <laughs> obfuscation. Oh pearl no! <laughs> but yeah, then somebody was being too clever. I was told that writing clever code was something you do for job security because no, if no one can read it, they can't terminate you. Sure, it's they also- can. They can just decide to change the entire code base. They'll hire somebody That's in true. to completely rewrite your code. But That's it, true. <laughs> I think it, it also depends on how, uh, how critical the code is to the, <laughs> the organization. But if it's very critical, another way to do it is to... Uh, is to choose very generic, bad, abstract variable names. <laughs> like V1, V2, like we're, we can't tell what the heck's going on by looking at the game. D- did um, I mention Microsoft Hungarian? <laughs> yeah. I've worked in a system where V1 and V2 are, are variable names. I didn't choose them. For for those curious, I'll I'll see if I can find a a link in the in the show notes. Microsoft Hungarian basically I think came from a time when everything had to be eight characters dot three extension because variable names would actually describe what they were containing. So you would have something like RGB LVM, which had nothing to do with color. RGB was range of bytes for a long vector math command. So the variable was RGB LVM. And of course, you also in, in uh, that style of coding can overload your Booleans that they're either false or have an integer value in them. Of course. How, how obvious. I believe the doctor <laughs> says, run. <laughs> so uh, I have to ask, was, I'm going to shift gears for a split second sure. from, from, from you uh, coming out to RW DevCon. We had a uh, we we had a game show not this past year 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 back where they gave away optional prizes and I was curious was that your idea or somebody else's that was my idea yes we this, uh, this was genius um so yeah you got to uh, you answered a number of questions and then you got optional prize optionals uh, up to five and then you open them up and it had a prize in it. Or nothing, um, no. <laughs> and um, no. did you open them or did you unwrap them? Well, you <laughs> unwrap. Them. Uh, in in oh, practice, physically, great. we didn't have them wrapped up because it would just take too long. But uh, yes, you would unwrap your prize optional and see what, if anything, you got. And uh, <laughs> and then uh, there were. Like, I think one of the boxes tended to have, like, a decent prize in it, and then two of the boxes had uh, crap I found laying around my house. Um, <laughs> Which is sometimes be, like, 10-year-old business cards. Yeah, so I had, like, a collection of all of my business cards when I was at Apple for my various positions. I had, uh, let's see, a, a wooden engraved web objects pen from way back in the day. <laughs> Um, oh, there was one where you could simulate moving, doing an intra-office move at Apple because it was like a, a page of stickers that you put on the moving boxes with the with my new office number on it. So that was, <laughs> and that one actually we gave away two years. What was it? Yeah, we gave away in uh, at the game show, and then the person who received it gave it back to me. <laughs> <laughs> so then we gave it away again the following year. Um, <laughs> and that time it stuck. So, um, Oh, bad pun. Bad pun. Oh, that was an unintentional one. <laughs> so I brought up optionals because you mentioned try question mark. And I figure we should talk about one of the, 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 the horrible, you're, you're ripping out your own net. And that is the force unwrapping. Oh, yes, which also you can do with try exclamation point. Um, To me, I don't – I'm trying to think if I ever force unwrap. I don't think that I do. The only time 
oh, that's, I don't force unwrap, but I will occasionally use as with an exclamation point. Like if I'm absolutely sure that, you know, I'm getting the, something like a parent view controller or especially at the top of the hierarchy of your app and you know like you're trying to set something up early on and you know that you know specifically these are the classes at the very top of my hierarchy and they always show up to you as view controllers I will force unwrap them or not I'll force type convert them to the specific subclass because if I change that, I want it to blow up if I get that wrong. So it's a programmer error if I change the hierarchy and I don't update my code accordingly. I think I, I, think I use it slightly more just because I don't like unassigned lets. Mm. If, I'm doing, if I'm doing a let that I know is going to be filled in later, I still tend to leave it as a, an optional var initially. I see. Just because it doesn't, I, I, I'm so conditioned to the concept of if it doesn't have a value yet, it should be nil. And the place that I find I do that most is when I'm dequeuing cells from a table. Okay. Because for some reason, dequeuing cells can still always come back as an optional nil. It doesn't, it, it never does, but it's, it theoretically can. And as a result, I am always saying dequeue, and then I've got that question mark, question mark, initialize a new version of my cell type to yes. say if this for some reason, but now I know that it's come back. Now I can basically force unwrap it because I've taken every step I can to guarantee it. Yes, that would make sense. And I think that possibly is the, maybe the only time I would also force unwrap is one of those where, you know, maybe the compiler doesn't know that this optional type, really is not optional like we know we definitely have something coming back um and again if something goes terribly wrong you will crash but you shouldn't yeah this code Ever, should right? never reach this line exactly <laughs> but and again i can understand them not changing the api because that is so ubiquitous through everybody's code that to make that one change to change the api contract to say no no we're kidding it will return something it's not optional it would just be too much overhead for everybody to go back and fix it because everybody fixes it in their own specific way that you can't just trust the the swift refactorer to fix that one correctly well and i the other thing i wonder is if because uh, i i haven't looked at that specific api and like bank like tried doing it wrong for a while, but does it return nil if you hand in an identifier, a cell identifier that has never been registered? That's possible. I, you know, I haven't thought that one through. That may be there because if you've given an identifier, it doesn't know, then it does nil out. That might be, that might be what the reason that it's like that. On the other hand, that's the kind of error that I would want to blow up, right? Yeah is uh, like I've screwed up, I passed in an identifier I haven't registered. So using try exclamation point would make sense. Be or not try, uh, unwrap exclamation point would make sense. Yeah. Um, the only other place I will unwrap optionals is using kind of an implicitly unwrapped optional uh, property. Like, like we sometimes will see or we'll see with... Uh, with uh, storyboard files, right? Where you have your outlets set up and there's that moment in time where the class has been initialized, but the outlets haven't been hooked up yet. Um, so by the time you get to view did load, everything should be hooked up correctly. So having it blow up if something's wrong at that point, I think is fine. So I always mark those as uh, implicitly unwrapped. James, it's a really good way to look at not just getting the apps. I think you put it really well right at the top is not just looking at the one good path, but knowing all the potential ways that the bad paths will come up and pretty much bite us every time. Absolutely. So we are going to take a short break uh, for a message from our sponsor, Triple Byte. But when we return, 
I'm going to talk about how I actually tried to dig myself into the hole by nesting controllers all the way down until I hit turtles. We'll be back right after this. This RayWenderlich.com podcast is brought to you by TripleByte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on phone screens, take-home projects, and that's assuming the company even responds to your interest or your cover letters. Well, if you're a software engineer, TripleByte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies, from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them, and if you do well, you get to go straight to the final interviews with the companies on their platform. It's like the common app for software engineers. TripleByte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. And I can appreciate that. Being in the industry for 35 years, I'm entirely self-taught. My undergraduate study was in theater, and I left school to do my first job. So I don't carry a bachelor's, no bachelor's of arts, no bachelor's of science. And that's the one thing I'm often trying to hide or misdirect on my resume. With TripleByte, they'd care more about the coding experience that I have and not worry about that one little fact. Apply now at triplebyte.com slash Ray. That's triplebyte.com, byte. B-Y-T-E, as in 8 bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through TripleByte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Thanks again to TripleByte for sponsoring this episode. And now we'll kick it back to Drew so he can tell us his experience in Code Hades. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if it was completely Hades, but it, it definitely went in directions I wasn't expecting. As always, I figured this season it'd be good to talk about personal programming projects. Um, not because I'm using this as a springboard to get help on my own software, but I figure if I can talk about simple problems or sometimes complicated problems, it may touch a, a chord with other people and they can say, yeah, maybe this is a good idea or a bad idea or, or both. And uh, this specific section of a, a program I'm working on is something that will actually display the I Ching. And I thought it would be nifty to display the I Ching, but be able to, oh, page through it. Now, to explain how the I Ching works, which is completely non-developer, you throw some random numbers, and then it picks a random number from 1 to 64. But there's a small chance that that 1 to 64 number may create a second number, 1 to 64. And what you want to see is some values about that number or both of them as the case may be. So I decided, okay, I'm gonna look at this thing through a UI view controller that's going to have a container view that holds a page controller. And the reason for the page controller is I could swipe back and forth between the one and the two. And then on that page controller that was swiping back and forth on, I put a table. So now I've got a table on a page thing. And this is sort of well, not necessarily the best concept because now you can move your UI in four different directions. You can move it up and down or you can move it left and right depending on where you move it left and right. Needless to say, also putting all of these individual view controllers together is an interesting feat in making sure that everything's connected in the right place and passing information up and down the right way. James, have I scared you yet or does this sound like a normal day at work? That sounds like an iOS project. <laughs> it Have sounds you, like the house that Jack built. Like that's you know, the app that Drew built. You know, it it really it, it really is one of those things. It's, it it is the the app that one built. That you start. Yeah, I, I found that that working with this, the best way to do it was to start with each individual tier of this. Start with the first controller and put in the container view that, and and I always have to be careful because I'm one of those people who never remembers vocabulary words. I took French for five years because I had a great accent but could not remember my vocabulary words. So I'm one of those people who will call a scroller, a slider, a scroller, a controller, a container, collection. Just those words all like to tangle in my head. And that's why we hire people who are in their 20s, not in their 50s, because the synapses slow down. And we just don't care. But the container view let me put a page view in. and. I find that one of the things that drives me crazy about UI table view controller and UI page view controller is that that's what your dedicated UI interface on that entire controller is. 
you can't add to that controller. In other words, a UI table view controller has a table on it, you're done. Yes, that's, um, I've been working on something that I can't talk about just yet. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I needed to, I needed to put some stuff alongside or above a table view and you can try to hack it, but that view controller is really, really wants to be just a table view. And so your options are either you can subclass plain old view controller and try to, and use it as a table view controller. Um, but then you lose the few things that table view controller does itself. Um, or I ended up having to kind of embed it in mm -hmm. yet another view controller, which is probably the approach you had to take too. Container um, view. Yes. Um, but then I lost something. Um, there's something that oh, I forget what it was now off the top of my head, but there's there's something that in terms of the was it the scroll view in the table view? There was something. Oh, you, it was do you something. Mean the, 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 the section the section scroller or the section no, it scrubber. Was, I, th I think it was the insetting um, of the table view working correctly. Mm -hmm. It knew that it prior. It knew that it was inside of uh, its parent, but now there was an intermediary view controller, mm -hmm. so it lost a bit of automatic sizing behavior. Yeah, um, which yeah, then I, I had to re-implement. One of the things that I find that I have to do when I try to embed a table of view controller is that I have to turn off the separators because the mm. separators think they know where the edge of the view is they're inside a table view controller they assume they are the main table view so they will set their their width in their own their own damn way um and i will typically wind up telling it not to display separators and then putting separators in my table cells and oh i see and the reason that i did this whole mess was that when you're looking at the I Ching, you look at this uh this random 64 is made up of six lines made up of two possibilities, two to the sixth. Except you can look at it as a set of six lines, or you can look at it as two sets of three lines, and those two sets of three lines each have their own little meanings, and each of the sets of six lines have their own meaning. And what I wanted to do was have, because it's not crazy enough to put a, text, a table view in there, I had to put a text view in there, which is the completely multi-sizing text, not a label, so that I could have the actual displayed graphic, Unicode, at the top in the section header, and as you page through the text below it, the header would stay locked to the top and you could still see the image at the top. So, now, I have a table view with text that can scroll, the table view can scroll, and the table view is on a page that can page back and forth. I think pretty much anybody at Apple would look at me and go, that's not how our UX is supposed to work. That's that's really, <laughs> that's not. Because you really, it depends how your finger hits the page and where your finger hits the page because you're actually able to scroll in a table cell as scroll a table as a whole. Yeah, I think just that makes it compl like complicated for the user also. Mm -hmm. um, you see that a lot... It, that shows up in uh, a lot of web pages too, right? Where you're trying mm -hmm. to scroll and then you're in and you can't figure out how to get to the end of the article because whatever you're, sc you're scrolling the wrong thing somehow. Um, and that's frustrating on a web page. I could see it being frustrating for the user a little bit on the, uh, in, in a table view with scrollable text in each because um, then you have to get your tap target very right and then potentially it'd be might maybe better to drill down to read all that extra detail. Yeah, and but unfortunately you then take in that concept, well, how long do you want people, how, how many clicks do you want somebody to have to endure to get all the information? Right, exactly. So, it's always the... So I, I really think that I may just limit it to not having a table view per se, but having locked text at the top, scrollable text view below it and then maybe buttons so you can choose what specific thing you're viewing 
but that doesn't change the fact that I may still have to have a page nation swipe between magical numbers one and magical number two. Um, and then another thing you might consider is um, instead of using a table view inside of a page, a page thing, possibly a collection view where you have multiple rows and columns where the columns are what you would currently have as pages. Well, as always, I'm, I'm doing all of my UX design on an iPhone SE because I figure somebody is going to try to use this app with the smallest imaginable phone. Mm-hmm. That's and how I always design yeah, my UI is. You know, and, and like, like, like a lot of developers, I, of course, you know, I go grab the expensive device so that I can have all the bells and whistles to play with on my device. And for testing purposes, I'm like, oh, good, now I can do this and I can play with that. But I remember that the average person is not going to have that device. The average person is going to have whatever device they get on their hands. And as a result, you have to make sure that your text is going to fit. One of the things that I'm just beginning to do, and this, this is a three-year-old project, give or take, a year when it was set down, but I'm beginning to convert a lot of stuff that was originally hard-coded text, not hard-coded strings, but the hard-coded labels to being um, the standard font sizes that they offer. That, so that... Oh, so the... Yeah, because you, uh, on the iPad... dynamic text. Yeah, because when I switch over to the iPad, everything is still iPhone-sized, and that doesn't work at all. Oh, that would... Yeah, that would definitely be nicer to be resized and then also for folks who maybe have accessibility um mm -hmm. who want very large sizes um or even just people getting their eyes are getting a little older so you want you know the the large size some people like to crank it down to the small font size i have no idea so of what you as speak as much as much density <laughs> as possible um but uh yeah that dynamic text uh, or excuse me, Dynamic Type API has also come along a lot since it was mm -hmm. first introduced. Um, when I f when it first came out, you basically had to manually update things. Um, now the type changes happen automatically for the system font. And if you had not the system font was the font you were using in your app, you pretty much had to come up with your own table of like yeah. lookup table um, and now there's a way that you can set up other fonts and the system will um, take that into account and you don't have to do it as manually anymore. And there is a fantastic dub dub video from I think 16 where they talk about not merely dynamic type but the design considerations they put into the font with the mm -hmm. kernings, with the ligatures mm -hmm. to make sure that when those letters are bold or when they're italicized or when they're not bold but small that they are still very readable and uh that was a very interesting session uh when san francisco was introduced basically yes. right as the system font um what i found very interesting also was that they talked a lot about that and they showed you this slide in many different sessions of like that font in many different like increasing sizes and they had that slide showed and they said dynamic type a lot but there was very little information about the api or what you're supposed to do with it mm -hmm. um thankfully that's kind of uh changed and they've improved it over the over the last was it four years now yeah yeah was it yeah i guess it was uh 15 or 16 when they introduced san francisco um but, yeah, I have that, that endless list of things that I should have been doing since the beginning on my app. The, the dynamic type is something I should have been doing. But then again, like I said, I started it three years ago. And I originally mm -hmm. started it as my beat myself into using Swift. I said, this is a project. I'm going to start from scratch in Swift. I taught myself Swift on this app. So there's whole sections of this app that just... I dread going back to, we talked about in the first half about mm -hmm. you know, writing nice, clear, concise code. Um, there's, I mean, I, I tried doing some code cleanup this week because I was doing uh, code coverage tests on one of my classes. And I said, why, why is this class even codable? Well, why, why, oh. <laughs> why, why is this class following, following coding? And I took it out and the program promptly crashed. And I was like, oh yeah, now I remember why. 
It's, I think that uh, ugly code that works is so much better than pretty code that doesn't. Well, pretty code that doesn't work really still isn't... Well, it's code, it's just not an app. <laughs> yes, it just doesn't do what you want it to do. Oh, I did actually have a question for you, which is this structure of view controllers at the kind of the top level of your app. Um, are you setting it up in a storyboard or programmatically? I am doing it programmatically. And the reason is that I have a very stylized interface. Okay. It's meant to basically be a Swiss Army knife of five or six different utilities. So it's got this uh, graphic on the front page that's a six-pointed star with menu items right at each corner, which let me tell you, putting that into auto layout, you line up, you know, lining a graphic up that's basically a square graphic, that's easy. Lining up the labels to find the points on a graphic star, that's not as easy. So I made no, the thing. No, that would not be easy. I made the thing geometric. There's a lot of programmable computations being done to say yes, this should be one seventh up the page, two thirds across the page, and that way, after a long time, it now uh, rotates. It fits both the iPad and the iPhones. It's it, it the nice. font size is resized, but but again, a lot of it is done with segways. It's not done with. Um, with navigation gotcha but it's um, it's a stylistic choice it could be done as such but it it fits the style of the app oh very that sounds very cool it'd be interesting to uh or at least until i go to um, wwdc and the uh, and the guys from the ux review take a look at it and go what is this crap <laughs> oh we i think over the years we've all seen some apps that are like Ugh, but then they're like top sellers and it's like oh well i guess <laughs> <laughs> so, I, it's always great to have good design, I think, but sometimes over the course of, like, the years, good design doesn't always mean you're going to have a successful product, and somehow a successful product doesn't always have the best design, as long as it's compelling in some way. Um, but, of course, it's always best to have both. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I... I <sighs> I have reasons for the decisions I've made. I wish I could say it has good design, but this is one of those projects of my own love for myself where I am the, devel the, the, the lead developer architect. I am the lead designer with not a designer myself. I am the PM who constantly tells myself to try to follow sprints, and I don't. I even use Jira. and oh dear. Uh, I, I've got my bugs in sort of a what am I going to work on for the next two weeks and then I get mm -hmm. distracted and if I could just hire three or four other people who would wait to get paid until I ship my app you know or find some VC yes yeah but then they tell me what they want the app to actually be that's true you kind of sell your sell your soul when you do that no but I think for a uh, especially for a passion project app perfection is definitely the uh, the uh, the enemy of of the good mm -hmm. it's it's much better to have an app that you like you use and you're proud of for yourself for your own reasons um and put it out into the world than to have everything be perfect yeah i mean this and it this, sounds cool and that's it the, the it does the I Ching is actually only one of the the six main pillars of this entire app i i like to refer to it as a, a a, a Wiccan or a pagan Swiss army knife in that it has a section on divination, <laughs> it has a section on astronomy, astrology, etc. And a corkscrew. And a corkscrew. It always has to have a corkscrew <laughs> or it can't open the cheap champagne. That's right. Or it can't be a Swiss army knife without a corkscrew. Um, no, that sounds very cool. Um, so yeah. are you, in the other sections, are you having kind of similar view controller conundrums or you know actually it's more straightforward it's interesting each one is its own beast for example the one on astronomy was really just a big collection view um so that i could show you each planet and each planet would tell you you know where is the planet in the in the sky where uh, are the next aspects when is the moon going to be full when do the seasons change etc one of them is actually just a gigantic clock 
of the sky showing you where the sun and the moon are in live time. It just, it's really just one view. But this section on the I Ching, because there's randomization, there's th mm -hmm. throwing random numbers in the way that people would do this to, uh, to divine these random numbers. And it's so nice that Apple actually finally has a random number generator that's got a nice, simple, succinct API to use it. Yes. Oh, I love the new random generation API in, in Swift Standard Library. Yeah. Um, that was a nice addition. Um, you know, without having to do, uh, was it arc rand? Mm -hmm. foot, drop down into C. And the other thing is I found uh, uh, as an instructor when people are like randomization is very useful when you're teach teaching somebody mm -hmm. a language because you can get something like get you know random colors to happen very easily and always having to drop down into some wacky it's not wacky but some less abstracted API just to get decent random numbers was always annoying or you could try to bring in game kit which is also like why do i have to bring in a whole framework just to get some random numbers well i mean um, in the I objective c days you had to basically pull in the darwin kit and start using the uh the actual um unix calls right exactly exactly um and you could even do that from swift right mm -hmm. they would they would come in because they're it's their c calls um yeah i think that was a nice addition to to swift Another thing that I think it just showed up last year when we we're talking about composing uh, uh, view controllers is so for many years um, there was kind of a series about scroll views and scroll view controllers and doing all sorts of fancy things with them. And there are a lot of WWC uh, sessions about that. And like having an infinite scrolling scroll view, for instance. And in those cases, you have kind of your content view, but you also have a content bounds. And you would manipulate that bounds to do the infinite scrolling thing. Yeah. So, um, but, but you could not do that with auto layout. Auto layout would always just take, it would just queue off of the, uh, the view that you gave it as the content view. So, a lot of times I need to do things programmatically because I'd go along and then I'd have to want to do something tricky with a, a scroll view and I'd have to put it in and turn off auto layout and use manual re like auto resizing and everything. Um, and then once within, the content view would start using auto layout again. And one of the nice things they introduced, I think it was just last year, was um, that you can now set one of those layout guide rectangles mm -hmm. in a scroll view, which means that then you can essentially do the same techniques that you used to be able to do or that you used to rely on manual layout to do. Um, you can now do that with auto layout, which I think is a nifty addition that I don't know if it was widely touted but when they announced it I was like oh cool finally I still unfortunately awesome. I still unfortunately have a hate hate relationship with scroll views for some reason I have to go back and rewatch the videos again because I always get things either lined up wrong or not scrolling correctly either it's the bounds of the frame or something of the context is just it fights me and I just don't know if I Someday I'll have that moment of grok with scroll views, and then I'll be a happy camper. No, I was going to say, but that may be why that I, I lean on text view a lot, or I lean on table views a lot, because they've got the scrolling part taken care of. Mm-hmm. And um, I find whenever I, if I need to do something fancy with a scroll view, I'm always going to go back to those videos, because one, they're really good sessions. They explain it very well. Um, but also, it's a very specialized set of information that doesn't come up every day when you're writing an app. So the fact that it's not in my head all the time, I, I can kind of forgive myself because it's very specific. It doesn't come up that often, and I know where I can go to refresh my memory when I need to. So, <laughs> all right, so effectively, I, I'm avoiding the scroll view uh, in lieu of a, a text view, but the text view is sitting inside a table view. But I think, I think from in general from the discussion, I think I'm just going to drop the table view entirely 
because all I'm really using the table view for is to lock the section header, which could be a locked view anyway. And the table and the text view itself could just be my scrolling text, and that way I don't have to worry about two different vertical scrolls at the same time. Gotcha. And how long is the text that folks are scrolling through? Is it is it per entry? Yeah, each each magical number has a little bit of an old Chinese passage about what the lines mean and what they represent. Um, there's a, a book, there are many books on the I Ching with many, many different translations from the old, uh, from, from the old Chinese original texts that are hundreds of thousands, I think, years old now. So effectively what I've done is I've found a translation that is in the public domain. Mm -hmm. I pulled the text and then depending on what number you get is which text displays and it can be anything from a couple of short sentences to three long paragraphs. I see. Nice. Yeah. That is nice. Yeah, and Yeah, I can't wait to see this app. <laughs> I can't wait to see this app. I've been working on it for so long. <laughs> it's one of those things that I every now and then I, I and, and it was interesting because the original motivation of this app was, like I said, to teach myself Swift, and I wanted to make a complication for my watch. Hmm. Oh, cool. So, An I Ching No, actually, the original, the original one was to just tell me where the sun and the moon were, so that I knew that the sun right now, well... Up there. We're, yeah, the sun is up <laughs> there, and the moon's over there. No, I mean, I like... The, go opposite. <laughs> the sun is currently in the constellation of Aries. The moon is currently in the constellation of, where are you? Cancer. I can just look at my watch, it'll tell me where it is, because one of the things that I was able to do was uh, with a Kickstarter, I pulled down the entire JPL library. So I've actually got the JPL library in the extension for the watch, and it's doing those oh, wow. computations on the fly. Oh, very cool. That's very cool. Yeah, one of the things they took out of watchOS four, uh, 5, is it 5 is the current one or 4? I, keep, I think 5 is the current one, was the... Uh, the, the scanning through time. You used to be able to go forward and back through time oh, yes. while looking at it. And they took that out of the current one. But if you use that on, on my complication, you actually used to be able to watch in time where the sun moved in the sky. Oh, that's very cool. But that's gone now, so that's extra code I can remove. Time travel, I think, was the feature. Yeah, time, tra time travel, but yes. they, took care, they, took, uh, they took it they out. They did. But yeah, so I've got parts of my code that... Uh, that work on the watch, parts of my code base that actually work on the TV. That's also very cool. Is it your intent to finish and ship, or is it... Because there's nothing... It honestly, is actually, there's, nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with having a, a pet project that is just continually in development, and it's for your own enjoyment and edification. I'll be honest. I, I have been now developing, well, since I was 11, but I've been developing professionally since I was about 23, 24, and I have shipped so many apps through the App Store, none of which have been mine. Mm -hmm. uh, both through the App Store, pre-App Store, and major packages. But I've been owned by companies. And this was the first project I said, I'm going to write an app and finally say, look, I've shipped my own app. Because on interviews, they always ask you, can we see apps you've shipped? And I'm like, well, uh, I, I've shipped Microsoft Office 2004. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that wasn't just me. <laughs> right. I don't. It was uh, like two other people. Yeah, that was a one two, free. I'm joking, of two, course. Two, was, two, two, was other, least, <laughs> two other, two other people. <laughs> <laughs> if you're counting in base point one. <laughs> uh, but um, and the funny thing was, I got to a point on one of my apps where I was trying to figure out how to do something, and I said, well, I don't want to just try to put this new section into the app, so I'm going to do something on the side to try to solve this problem. And I, mm -hmm. I put a really simple UX together just so I could test this idea, and I was like, oh my god, this is shippable, this side thing. So I actually shipped my first app, and it was a side project to figure out how to do something in the main project. Mm-hmm. So I actually wrote a small app called, I think it's called Floating Holidays, which basically shows you when holidays are that aren't the ones that are glued to any specific calendar date. Oh, oh cool. Like Easter. Or yeah, like, like Easter or Ramadan or Passover mm -hmm. or when the seasons change, when uh, equinoxes are. 
Right, right. Because uh, the whole thing was I needed to find out when the moon phases were. And I needed to go do the math on how to compute moon phases because I was originally going to go through... Uh, there's a, a site on navy.mil that has all of that stuff, but they recently changed their stuff from HTTP to HTTPS, but don't actually distribute the HTTPS cert. Oh. Hmm. So unless you happen to, say, bypass the security or or download a cert with your app, which is sort of a bad thing. Right, absolutely. I couldn't use that, so I had to figure out how to do it on my own. But now it's self-contained and you don't have to rely on the Navy. Yep. Yeah, and it's but nice, too, because I, I've been able to do things in app that, that have bothered me in all the other companies I've worked in. Like, I actually have a section of my app that here are all my third-party tools that or libraries that I've used. Because mm -hmm. as a programmer, it's like, I want that up big and tall. You know, if I'm using somebody else's code, I want them to get credit. Absolutely. And most major companies are like, well, no, we don't put people's name into the code. That's not important. Yeah, usually unless you're using a, a piece of open source software in your app where it's legally required to put put it in there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, But usually it's hidden somewhere as far away from the user as possible. So it's legally compliant, but almost impossible to find. Yeah, usually there's a line in the app saying, for more information, go to the website and find this 404 page. Oh, yeah, that's page. also true. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, my first iOS app was, uh, uh, it's still shipping. It's, uh, I'm a big fan of Disney and Pixar movies. And um, so it's called Walt, the Watched Animation List Tracker. And it basically lists all, there's over now 650 uh, short film, short animated films and uh, full-length animated features from Pixar and Disney. And uh, it lists all of them and you keep track of which ones you've seen so it's basically a big checklist app um but as a first app on my own on ios you know it's got the tab view the table view filtering sorting all of the you know checked all of the the big boxes in terms of getting experience with those um and it was fun and it was something i wanted so uh that one worked out well and it i still update the app i have to actually have a item on my to-do list i have to add toy story 3 which is coming out um Ooh. four. Oh, four. sorry yeah three's been out for ages wow yeah and and, and every time they do a sequel and full disclosure i've just given you another 70 cents oh fantastic thank you <laughs> i was That's, going to ask have you watched all the movies on the list um well i can i can look <laughs> I'm going to sit here and I'm going to start checking things off now. That's the worst part. Uh, so I've seen every Pixar short. I've seen every Pixar uh, feature film. I have not seen the Disney films The Black Cauldron. Oh, Ooh, that's a, a classic. Good one. I know. It's a it's very just, good one. <laughs> I haven't found it anywhere. Like, it hasn't. Um, I haven't watched The Rescuers Down Under all the way through. Not a great Ooh, loss there. Good one. <laughs> all right, and we, I, we, we'll agree to disagree on that one. <laughs> and um, I also have not watched what some say is the worst Disney animated film ever, Chicken Little. I enjoyed it. I have to admit. Did you? I, okay. I, I went into it with not the highest expectations, but it was kind of funny. I've seen far worse it, films since then, but not... Gotcha. Well, um... I think possibly in the running for worst Disney animated film was Home on the Range, if you saw that one. Mm, was it my favorite? With the cows. The yodeling scene yeah. was fun. But <laughs> other than that. But uh, the real question here is, have you seen The Black Hole? Oh, yes. Oh, that's my favorite. That one's really good. Although really? I will say that... I think it's fun. It's nostalgic. It's definitely a oh Star Wars did well. <laughs> What's what <could> <laughs> yeah? Well, wasn't it's so bizarre? <laughs> well, wasn't Black Hole like supposed to be Disney's first foray into PG? I think it may have been. Really? Yeah, um, it was a pretty early. It may have been their first PG. So the one thing about my app is it focuses on animated films, not live action. 
mm-hmm. and only from those two studios. Um, so, like, Mary Poppins is not on the list because it's not considered part of their animated canon, even though it has animated sections. Um, I, what? I bet, I bet, I bet all the, <laughs> the Frey Wenderlich podcast listeners are thrilled about all these minor distinctions. <laughs> <laughs> They're important. We're not afraid oh, to go are. left or right here. Um, but the the thing that really inspired me to write that app is that um, after Walt Disney hit it big with uh, with Mickey Mouse, he started doing this series of cartoons called the Silly Symphonies. Um, oh. And one of my favorite places is the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco. And if you haven't been there, it is so worth a visit i find it very inspirational um and seeing the amount of progression in these silly symphony cartoons from in a 10-year period like it goes from kind of the the kind of how do i want to put it uh they call it like a garden hose kind of not very realistic looking animation to what really looks like that classic Disney animation. The leaps that they made in that 10-year period were just amazing. And I thought, I really want to see all of these, and I need to keep track of how to see them all. So they're all in that app. I love your interface for this app, that when you've checked off a whole bunch of films, you actually get a pie chart. Neat. Yes, so it, it will show you how far along you are. And I kind of, uh, for the short films, it's also divided up into different series, so you can tell if you've seen all the goofy cartoons, all the Mickey Mouse cartoons, um, all the sil- silly symphonies. Oddly enough, I I did this a number of years ago. I still have only watched half of the silly symphonies, even though that mm. was the whole reason I wrote the app. Um, yeah, and you can... Slice and dice, view them by decade, by studio, you can, by director. Um, it's a fun little app. Oh, what a cool idea. See, now I'm looking for my favorite director, and I don't know whether or not he ever worked for Disney or not. Who is he? Chuck or, Jones. Uh, I don't think Chuck Jones ever worked for Disney. No, he was, he was always owned by Warner Brothers. Yeah. I love his, I think it is the quote by him that every artist has... Was it like twenty thousand or two hundred thousand bad drawings, um, and you have to get through them first to so yep. get started? Um, I forget the exact number he used, but it's a lot. Uh, it's, I think it's like any kind of art or creative venture. I think you've got two hundred thousand lines of really bad code in you before you get the really good stuff out. It's true, and then sometimes you have some of those lines show up later too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bad ones keep coming back. And then you wind up trying to have six or seven nested controllers, and you wonder why you were doing that in the first place. Well, when you're coming up to speed, say, on a new language like Swift, even if you're an experienced developer, you're not experienced in that language. Mm -hmm. Um, So very often you're still kind of writing, thinking in the language you are coming from. Um, And it does take a while. And then when the language is moving out from underneath you um, every year, the best practice from three years ago is not necessarily the best practice today. And so that code, you go back and people will say, how could you write this terrible? Well, that's how it was when I wrote it. As always, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Exactly. It seemed like the best idea at the time. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I I, I may have to revise my, my old phrase there. It seemed like the best idea at the time. You know, you, you, you have several options. And sometimes you, you've got two or three options, and well, your PM has basically said you can't take the best option. Do you want it right? right. Do you want it right now, or do you want it now? I mean... <laughs> very true. Very, very true. Once you've gotten through those 20,000 lines of code, and you get those good lines coming, the hope is that most of the lines that will continue will be good. We talked earlier in the show about the fact that there are problems, and you try to steer knowing what could go wrong rather than just steering for the right way and it's always good to take a step back from something you've been working on and see where it is and how it fits together james i cannot thank you enough for being on the show this evening it's it's uh, as i said an honor to have you here i i look forward to the next time we run into each other also can you talk again about your performance in june 
Oh, absolutely. So uh, the week of WWDC in San Jose, Wednesday, June 5th, uh, we'll be doing live near WWDC, a benefit concert for App Camp for Girls. You do not need to have a WWDC ticket to come to our show. Uh, the URL is live near WWDC.com. Um, go there for all the info. And uh, there is a ticket that the, all the proceeds go to App Camp for Girls. And it's a fantastic show. Last year we had like 18 different musicians on stage, guitarists, violin, cello, drums. Ba- it's just it's a wild, fun time. And then uh, a full uh, open bar is included with your ticket. So it's quite the party. I am definitely looking forward to attending it. I, I look yeah, forward to it seeing you like there. Yeah, it sounds like a great time. It is. We have a great time every year. James, I want to thank you again. That is going to draw things to a close for this first episode of Season 9. We'll be back in two weeks. Our guest is going to be Erica Sedun. And we want to once again thank Triple Byte for sponsoring this episode of the Ray Wendelik Podcast. But until our next episode, we go back to the Emerald Castle. Ray, back to you. And that's a wrap. Thanks again, everybody, for listening to the RayWendelik.com podcast. We hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget to leave a rating on iTunes. See you next time.